This is a video about the philosophy of history. Now, um, if you know much about philosophy, you probably know the main branches of philosophy. Metaphysics, which is the study of reality. Epistemology, which is the question of truth and knowledge. How do I know that I know what I think I know? Ethics, which is the study of what, you know, what is the good life? What does it mean to have a good life? Um, how am I supposed to live in this world? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Uh, but there are also a number of uh, uh, domains in philosophy that are the philosophy ofs, uh, philosophy of various things. Philosophy asks questions about everything, about every aspect of life. Um, and so there is a philosophy of religion, which asks questions about what what people do when they're doing religion. So, you know, and questions like, is there a God? Um, arguments for the existence of God. Questions like, why is there uh, evil in the world if God is a God of love? Those are questions that the philosophy of religion studies. There's philosophy of art. Philosophy art, of art asks questions like, you know, what, what makes something art? Um, what's the difference between something I scribble on a napkin and something Picasso scribbled on a napkin? Um, is there bad art? Or is art, is beauty in the eye of the beholder? This particular video is about the philosophy of history. Philosophy of history asks questions like, well, what is history? Uh, is history going somewhere? What is it that historians are really doing when they do history? What should they do when they do history? So this is a video about the philosophy of history. Now, Herodotus has sometimes been called the father of history. Obviously, the Chinese aren't going to call Herodotus the father of history. And so we immediately, again, get into uh, here when we're talking about Herodotus as the father of history, we get into the philosophy of history. Well, why do some people call him the, the, the father of history? Well, the, the person who called him the father of history was a Roman named Cicero. Cicero lived in the first century BC. Herodotus was a Greek who lived in the, the, the 400s BC. Why did Cicero call him the father of history? Um, well, for one thing, Herodotus is a Greek and Cicero is a Roman. Why would Cicero consider Herodotus part of his history? Or did he? Um, I think he did. And this made sense because the Romans had conquered the Greeks military, mer militarily. I can't remember who it was, uh, a Roman, who said that the, the Romans may have conquered the Greeks militarily, but the Greeks conquered the Romans culturally because the Romans then absorbed Greek culture um, uh, from, from the Greeks. But obviously a Chinese person or a person from India or a person from uh, Africa is going to be less likely to consider Herodotus to be the father of history for them. But did Cicero have, was there some truth to what Cicero was saying? Well, Cicero uh, called him the father of history because he thought that Herodotus stuck more to what actually happened rather than writing poetry that's pleasurable about the gods. Um, so uh, Cicero thought that Homer talking about Achilles and Trojans and, and, and uh, Agamemnon and you know all those people and horses, he considered that to be more um, fanciful, more legendary. Um, he didn't consider that to be history. And of course Herodotus was writing about the Persian Wars, um, which had happened with, within his lifetime. You know, you may have seen the movie The 300. Um, and so Herodotus was writing about the recent past, and so it had a more real um, uh, flavor to it than writing about something that allegedly happened, you know, 500, 600 years, 700 years ago. Um, and so uh, this is why Cicero thought that Herodotus was, was writing more history uh, than poetry for pleasure, uh, because he uh, was writing about um, things that had actually happened rather than fanciful things from the past. Of course, Plutarch, even at that time, Plutarch, writing in the first century A.D., called Herodotus the father uh, of lies rather than the father of history. Um, well, let's let's ask what what really was, if anything, unique or different about Herodotus as opposed to the people that came before him. Well, for one thing, Herodotus dis did not just privilege the Greeks. He did not just privilege his own people or the perspectives of his own people when he wrote. This is probably why Plutarch didn't like him. Plutarch felt like Herodotus gave too much credit to non-Greeks. And this probably means that Plutarch was a bad historian. Uh, actually, I would say that Plutarch is rather fanciful in his reconstructions of the lives of, of ancients and so forth. 
he's not very uh, un, he's not unbiased. The historian tries to be unbiased. The historian tries to take into the, the points of view of not just the position you like the most, but also the position of the the other people. And so, um, one of the reasons why Herodotus is probably a little different uh, from even even books like First and Second Kings. First and Second Kings privilege the the perspective of Israel and and not just all Israelites, but the the perspective of southern Judah. Uh, certainly, somebody from the northern kingdom would not have written First Kings the way First Kings is written. I mean, if you look at First Kings, there are no kings from the north who are good kings. All the kings from the north are bad kings in First Kings. And so, um, in that sense, First Kings is not written uh, in a way that brings in the perspectives of the northern kingdom or the perspectives of the Assyrians uh, in Second Kings or the perspectives of the Egyptians and so forth. And so the fact that Herodotus took into account the perspectives of not just the Greeks but other peoples uh, was different about his telling of history. As I mentioned, he was writing about more recent events rather than the distant past. I mean, we have access to archaeology and a lot of things that um, someone like Herodotus would not have had uh, access to. And so it makes sense that if you're writing about recent events, it's going to have a more, shall we say, historical uh, dimension to it than than when an ancient person is writing about the distant past. It just uh, when you're writing about the distant past, it's just it's uh, especially in that day and age, it's it's just natural that it's going to become more legendary and fanciful as you go back into the things that you just don't have direct access to. Herodotus sought out primary sources. When you seek out a primary source, you're getting it from the horse's mouth. You're not getting it from the cat telling you what the horse said. You're getting it from the horse itself. The, the more layers there are between you and the source, um, the more likely it is that it's been skewed by some perspective. If you can actually go and talk to the person, um, and this can happen, you know, of course, when you hear a rumor. Um, you, may, you may jump on a rumor because you like it, because it makes somebody you don't like look bad. Uh, but if you really want the truth, you need to seek out the, the real people who are involved with it. Get it straight from the people who are involved with it. The primary sources. That's good history uh, investigation, as opposed to simply believing whichever source makes the most. You know, what, when you, uh, this this happened, for example, to um, uh, Dan Rather, who was a, a newscaster several years ago, uh, who's kind of disappeared from the scene now. Uh, but uh, there was a a forged document about President George Bush Jr. and uh, uh, that's not his name, but anyway, the, the younger George Bush. And uh, Dan Rather was just sure that this document was um, was true uh, because it fit into what he, you know, believed uh, about the character of th that president. Uh, it turned out it was a forgery, and he lost his job. But but um, this this idea of not trusting secondary sources, but going straight to the horse's mouth, getting the the real scoop, the eyewitness account, um, seeking out primary sources. That's good history writing. Um, and of course, for the most part, Herodotus used normal cause-effect descriptions. You know, it's true, um, the crumbs that I'm seeing on the counter might have been uh, a demon, you know, that invaded my kitchen and my cookie drawer, and the demon really munched down on the, or an angel, you know, on the cookie. I mean, th that may be what happened, uh, especially since I believe in angels and demons. Um, but what is the most natural explanation of those cookie crumbs? Well, the most natural explanation is that somebody in my house, uh, somebody who's who I know to have been in the house uh, in the time between the cookies being put in the drawer and the crumbs being on the table, somebody in the house ate it. This is normal historical kind of thinking, and Herodotus uses it rather than using gods as as a um, kind of a at the last minute Superman comes in and rescues the day. You know, um, using normal cause and effect reasoning is generally better history writing than um, bringing in other explanations that you, you aren't sure about. For example, conspiracy theories. If you think about it, the idea of a conspiracy theory is that things aren't the way they appear, but that something sinister is going on behind the scenes. Well, think about it. The, 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 if the definition of a conspiracy theory is that things aren't as they appear, then by the very nature of what a conspiracy theory is, it is less likely to be true. Because 
things as they appear is the normal way of reconstructing events. And so conspiracy theories, by their very nature, are less likely to be true than the what you see is what you get approach to history writing. Well, I may have spent too much time on uh, Herodotus, but th there are reasons to consider Herodotus to be distinctive within the flow of um, uh, history telling in the ancient world, and the features I've just mentioned are some of them. But it, it really hasn't been till modern times. Leopold von Ranke uh, lived in the early 1800s um, uh, until we really begin to refine historical method in the ways that we've just been talking about it. So von Ranke suggested three criteria for good history writing. Um, first of all, tell it like it happened. This approach to history uh, telling is sometimes called historicism, where you try to tell it exactly how it happened. Now, I would say that uh, it is pretty much agreed by all historians today that you can't do this, that all history writing involves interpretation. You have to decide which events are, are significant and which events aren't significant. And this kind of selection, deselection, um, and interpretation of causes and effects inevitably brings subjectivity into history telling. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that, that there aren't more and less um, objective tellings of history. I think there are. There are tellings of history that are clearly off the wall in their subjectivity. Uh, and there are clearly more objective tellings. Uh, the key to objectivity is, is that you're willing to follow the, follow the evidence wherever it leads. If you're not willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads, then you're not objective. Um, if you're not willing to describe the evidence as it seems to be, um, then, then you are not a good historian. You are somebody who should not be trusted, in fact, because you are not oriented around the real world. You're oriented around ideas that may or may not be true. Um, and so this, 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 uh, the idea of objective is, is that I'm willing to, to evaluate the evidence uh, as it actually is, regardless of what I want the evidence uh, to say. Um, and part of this is to question your sources. So one of the things that von Ranke criticized about history telling in his day is that people tended to just believe certain sources um, because they liked them, and they didn't realize that the sources that they were using had a perspective too. This is true with, for example, the Jewish historian Josephus. When you're reading Josephus' uh, account of the first century, you have to take into account the fact that he had a perspective. Here's a guy who defected or, or surrendered to the Romans in the, in the Jewish war of the late 60s. Um, and so he, has, he, he wants to defend himself as having done the right thing. You know, somebody writing uh, another version might say, um, you were a coward, uh, Josephus. Um, you were a, a traitor. Somebody else might write that way. Josephus obviously is not going to present himself as a traitor, and he's writing for the Romans, so he's obviously not going to critique the Romans that much. So, von Ranke suggested that when you're when you're reconstructing history, you need to you need to take into account the bias of your sources. This last bit of von Ranke, and I, I put it in my own words, but I think this is very important because we often have a tendency to uh, organize history according to our ideas rather than letting the data of history itself tell us what the categories are. So, you know, uh, we, we, this is e even calling the Middle Ages the Middle Ages is an example of this. Why are they called the Middle Ages? I mean, nobody living in the Middle Ages said, well, it's uh, the Middle Ages and we're here in, you know, ancient France in the Middle Ages. Nobody said that. The very idea of the Middle Ages is an imposition on a period of history done by later people done by people who didn't consider the Middle Ages so intelligent. In fact, other, other people called it the Dark Ages. Now, there's a value judgment, an idea imposed upon hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, uh, since most of us uh, in my circles are Protestants, we kind of find that very comfortable because we don't mind calling the Catholic period the Dark Period and, and so forth. Um, but this, this idea that the, the Renaissance, the rebirth, um, as, as if there was no culture prior to the, the, the 14 and 1500s. Uh, these are value judgments. This is organize, organizing history by ideological systems rather than letting the data of history generate it, its own uh, categories. Um, Francois Lyotard, 
um, was the one who coined the first uh, or, or, or uh, coined the word postmodernism, and he described postmodernism as a a strong resistance to what he called grand receipts uh, or large stories, and and the idea here is is that that the more that you try to create large ideological systems out of data, uh, whether it be history or whether it be um, uh, reality, what, the, the more you try to organize the, the, the infinite and diverse data of history uh, into large, uh, what, what are called topologies or, or systems of thought, the more likely you are to, to skew um, that, that individual bits of data. And so, um, when we are we are on the most firm basis when we're describing uh, events uh, that are local and a particular time and place, because then we're looking at what I call the petite receipt, um, the the small story. Um, and but the more that we try to organize history into large ideological systems, the 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 more likely it is that we're skewing a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, von Ranke was reacting here to a philosopher named Hegel. Hegel had had divided all of history into this evolution of uh, of things against things and synthesizing, and then things against things, um, basically uh, dividing up history into the uh, the the flow of ideas versus ideas. Beware of large ideological systems when it comes to history because they are, by their very nature, likely to skew things. I mean, even to call, uh, or, or even to say right now we live in a postmodern age, what, what are you exactly saying? There are a lot of people who aren't postmodern. There are a lot of people who are as, as uh, anti-postmodern as ever right now. Um, and so, you know, by, by labeling a, a, even a decade as a certain thing, you're immediately running the risk of skewing a whole lot of stuff that happened uh, in a decade. Well, okay. Ernst Trolsch uh, wrote in the early 1900s, he had three criteria as well. Um, he said, first of all, that history is revisable, um, that we get new data, and so we need to always be willing to revise um, uh, previous understandings of history in the light of new evidence. The new perspectives on, on evidence can arise that haven't been thought of before, and sometimes um, uh, that, that moves us along. I think that we are in a, you know, we, we live after so many thinkers have thought so many things that we can come across way smarter than, than, than all these people who've lived for thousands of years. Not because we are smarter than them, we're not any smarter than the people of the past, but we have so much more to draw on um, in our understanding uh, than, than they did. We should be able to come up with more coherent and, and corresponding uh, hypotheses uh, than ever before because we've had so many people take a shot at it uh, up till now. We can pick the best ones. Um, now, this second principle of Trolsch is um, a little bit problematic from a Christian perspective. And this is his principle of analogy. He basically said, if you don't see it happening now, it couldn't have happened back then. You know, if people don't live to be 965 years today, then they couldn't have lived to be 965 years uh, in Methuselah's day. Um, you know, he's, this is his, reflects what, what we might call his anti-supernaturalist bias. What he's saying is, is that, that uh, we don't have Athena dropping in for lunch today, and therefore Athena didn't drop in for lunch, you know, 3,000 years ago. Um, now, of course, Christians generally do believe that God intervenes in history today. Uh, Christians believe in miracles. Christians believe in uh, the supernatural. Um, and uh, I've, I've known Christians from the third world who've witnessed resurrections. Uh, so uh, Trolsch would say, well, resurrections don't happen today, and therefore Jesus couldn't have been risen from the dead back then. Um, you know, I'm not sure that that really um, is, is a, a, a valid claim at all. Um, but in general, we get what he's saying, even if, even if I don't go with it completely. There is a sense that, that uh, there is a kind of normal operating of the world, a kind of a principle of cause and effect that if uh, you know if you see something happen you you look for a cause that fits that um, and so the question we have as Christians is when do we say a miracle happened here I think normally when we look back in history we should again I, I think it makes sense to say you know what's what's the cause and effect of of what's happening you know 500 years ago 
and, and think of it similarly to the way cause and effect happens today. But when we've exhausted, well, I can't really explain this on the basis of cause and effect, I'm going to say a miracle happened here. Um, this, this is, a, uh, I think, a valid Christian way of thinking. But these were Trolsch's principles, and Trolsch, again, was anti-supernatural, so he basically used these principles to say that you can't, you can't believe in miracles in the Gospel of Mark uh, because he didn't believe miracles happened today. Of course, I think most Christians believe that miracles do happen uh, today. Okay, well, um, some of the pushback on uh, the historicism of von Ranke. Um One is, as I've already mentioned, that all history telling involves selection and interpretation. And this implies that there is no such thing as completely objective history telling. All history telling is subjective to some extent. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't try. We should try. There, are, there are, is history telling that's completely um, subjective, um, and, and hopefully we develop a skill for smelling out uh, completely one-sided tellings of history. Um, this is a great quote by Orwell. He who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future. Uh, that's from 1984, or George Orwell's famous book. Um, it fits with Michel Foucault's um, idea that power has an awful lot to do uh, with the way you tell history. History is told by the winners. You might have heard that expression. The idea here is, is that if I can control the story, then I can control how you behave going forward. So um, as, as I record this video, we're in the middle of a government shutdown, and we may be headed for a default on our budgetary obligations in the next few days. I hope it doesn't happen. Um, but the way that we tell the events um, will, uh, you know, there's a, there is a fight right now uh, for who controls what, what, how, what has happened here. Is, is the narrative this, um, that uh, Congress came to a point where it was supposed to increase the debt limit, um, as it has done often in the past, uh, but it decided to co-opt this opportunity uh, to try to uh, defund uh, the Health Care Act that Obama, President Obama had passed. Um, and uh, so they stubbornly won't um, um, give in to do what they need to do uh, until um, they get their way. Is that the way we tell the story, or do we tell it this way, that uh, uh, the president uh, is a dictator uh, who has forced uh, health care reform on the American people who don't want it, um, and um, the uh, Congress decided to take one last stand, um, and the president isn't willing to compromise on it. You know, if he would just compromise a little, they would pass these laws. I mean, who controls the story of what's happening? And of course, some people watch their news channel to get the one version, and other people watch the other news channel to get the other version. Orwell's basically saying is whoever can, whoever can control the telling of the story can control what it looks like going forward. Um, and, and, you know, history is told by the winners because the winners uh, control the story. Um, so, you know, when we talk about Hitler, Hitler's a bad guy. I think he was a bad guy. I mean, I really think that's objective, <laughs> pretty objective that Hitler was a bad guy. But I guarantee you that if the Nazis had won, that history would have been told much differently than, than it's told now. Um, you know, a, lo a lot of Russians grew up hearing uh, that Russia had been the first on the moon, uh, as I recall. Um, so, at least I've heard that, but I haven't heard the primary sources, so maybe that's me just believing what I want to believe. Uh, another another thing here is is that um, uh, Clifford Geertz is a famous sociologist and anthropologist who suggested that um, Telling history is not just, or, or talking about a culture, um, he was not so much a historian, but talking about a culture is not so much about talking about just actions. So like take the biblical command to greet the brothers with, a, or that's not really a command, but the instruction to greet the brothers with a holy kiss. If I go to my church and I greet a guy with a, a kiss, um, it's not going to mean the same thing as what that action meant in, in the first century. We can do exactly what they did in Bible times and not be doing what they did because the socio-cultural matrix in which that action is defined is different. I would say that even saying that the husband is the head of the home or that the wife needs to submit to her husband, I think that has a vastly different connotation in 21st century America than it had in 1st century uh, Greco-Roman uh, culture. And so 
uh, this idea of describing history not just in terms of who, what, where, when, but in terms of what the significance of actions were uh, back then um, is, is essential to a real thick understanding of history. Um, so what is the significance of money? There are a lot of uh, uh, organizations that want to give you a biblical view of money, but, but a lot of those organizations have no idea how differently money uh, has a connotation in an agrarian society of the Bible and the connotations of money in a um, monetary economy such as we have. Or even what is a person? We're individualists. And so we read the Bible as individualists without even realizing that the people who wrote these and read these texts were not individualists. They were group-oriented people. Um, so um, telling history involves not just in inserting our cultural assumptions into the past, but interpreting history in terms of the the cultural assumptions of the people we're writing about, um, and and uh, what what were their intentions in their time and place. Of course, we don't really have access uh, to a person's intentions. We only have access to what they say uh, and how it manifests itself. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. I hope there are various ap approaches to history. Uh, there are cyclical views, there are uh, linear views of history. I would say the default view of, of human beings is cyclical, you know, everything repeats itself, history repeats itself. Um, the linear view really comes into play with the rise of Jewish apocalyptic uh, in, the, in the centuries right before Christ. Uh, here we begin to stretch out all of history um, into a series of events, starting usually with a, a beautiful past and usually degenerating uh, down into the present, and then there's usually a, a kind of a, a God moment where God comes in, cleans things up, and then everything is good to go on. Um, that, of course, in Jewish apocalyptic, was never understood in terms of absolute eternity. Um, in Jewish apocalyptic writing, um, apocalyptic is like the book of Revelation. Um, there was That was just the end of the age, and then a new age began. They didn't think in terms of timeless eternity by and large. Um, but but um, Christianity, especially St. Augustine's The City of God, writing the 400s, begins to think of, a, uh, of, of history in a, in a much more linear fashion. So for Augustine, there's the city of God and there's the city of man, and these two are, uh, to some extent, in conflict with each other. But he saw the city of God increasing and the city of man disappearing, of course, Augustine lived through the sacking of Rome, uh, which had to have been a cataclysmic thing. How can Rome, how can, how can barbarians invade Rome? And kind of like the way Americans felt on 9-11. How can a terrorist come to America? I mean, that, that just was unheard of, unthought of, that somebody would actually reach our soils. Not since uh, uh, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor had, had something like that uh, happened. It certainly wasn't something I'd ever experienced. Um, and so Augustine had this, this philosophy of history that basically saw the city of God growing and growing and growing and the city of man de decreasing and decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. Um, we, we see this in the church today. Um, there are a lot of Christians who have what we might call a premillennial view of history. And this is the idea that things are just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And when we're about to just blow up the whole world, God will come in and rescue us all. That's probably not the dominant view that Christians have had throughout history. Um, probably most Christians throughout history have had more of a post-millennial view that saw things as getting better and better and better and better and better and better and better, and better you know, and the kingdom of God, you know, um, arrives. Um, and, and these are assumptions that we may not even realize we have. Do we have an assumption that things are just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse? Or do we have an assumption that things are going to get better and better and better and better? Neither one of them is an exclusively Christian view. There are Christians who've held held both of them. And so again, uh, philosophy is about b knowing yourself, becoming aware of your own uh, assumptions. I'm going to talk briefly about myths of progress. So, um, uh, especially uh, in the last, uh, you know, 150 years or so, from time to time, we've told ourselves a myth of progress. Progress is inevitable. Things are going to get better and better and better. Uh, this this went along with evolution in the late 1800s, um, and of course, World War One kind of dashed it to pieces. Uh, and then World War II and the Great Depression kind of dashed it uh, to pieces. But I, I would say that ab around the year 2000, I was very much feeling that progress uh, zeitgeist or spirit of the age. 
Um, then 9-11 came, and I think for the last, you know, over 10 years since 9-11, America has been in a kind of apocalyptic mindset. Things are getting worse. It's the end of the world. Um, and that, that has affected the way, for example, college students today uh, see the world um, and, it, and in ways that I don't think are all positive. Um, but um, that's kind of where we're at. Um, but there have been myths of, of, of progress. The myth of communism that Karl Marx uh, spun out in the 1800s, again, he, he imposed this ideological system uh, on history. He saw history as this thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So you had the slaves versus the, the kings, and then the synthesis is uh, merchants versus um, uh, rulers, and then you have the the bourgeois versus the proletariat, you know, and so he took he took the incredibly complex data of history. I mean, good grief, how preposterous is this ideological system of Karl Marx? Uh, he imposed upon the very diverse data of history this this very simplistic uh, theory about how history has has developed and evolved. He believed eventually um, we would live in in a a uh, communist society where nobody had any possessions of their own. Um, history hasn't, by the way, um, vindicated his theory. But even the idea of Western civilization um, was invented to kind of say there is this thread of civilized people, and everybody else is stupid, you know. Uh, but it, it, you know, this idea that it started in Sumer and then it went to Babylon and then to the Assyrians and the Babylonians and eventually to the Greeks and then the Romans and. And, and now we're, we're in you know, Europe. Um, this, this, uh, this myth of progress of Western civilization basically said everybody who's been smart um, is in my lineage, is in my past, and it's, it's led up till uh, today. And of course, uh, American exceptionalism um, is part of that story of progress, that we, the idea that Americans are better than everybody else um, because we stand at the pinnacle of this evolutionary process of, of civilization. Well, um, what is a Christian to think? And I just want to end uh, this uh, video presentation with uh, what a Christian view of history might be. Well, Christians take, uh, by the way, you can do this even with the Bible. The, the Bible is 66 individual books, and a lot of the stories in the Bible didn't originally connect to each other. Um, but we as Christians, in hindsight, have, have uh, hopefully with the help of the Holy Spirit, conceived of Scripture as a grand narrative. And we've plugged all the individual time-relevant stories into that grand narrative, we, we believe, um, um, starting with creation and then the, the sinfulness of humanity uh, and then leading up to uh, what we might call two climaxes to the story of history. The first climax is when Jesus dies on the cross and rises from the dead victoriously. That is the center of history uh, as a Christian tells it. Obviously, a Muslim would not tell the story that way. A Jew would not tell the story that way. A Buddhist would not tell the story that way. But for Christians, as we tell the story of history, the death and resurrection of Christ on the cross is the very center point of, of, of history. And then, of course, the final climax of the story is when Jesus comes again. And we live now in between the times. We live in this, this age in which um, the solution uh, of, the, of humanity's story has been, has been solved by Christ, but it hasn't been fully implemented. And so we wait for that final time when Jesus comes and sets everything uh, straight again. This is an imposition of organization on history that we do by faith. Um, you know, again, there are other ways to tell the story, and other people do tell the story of history. Uh, differently, but this is the way Christians tell the story, and we do so because of our faith uh, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He was God come to earth, that He died for our sins, that He rose again, that we might rise again, and that He will come again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That is the way uh, the Christian story is is organized, um, and that is um, the grand receipt uh, that we believe in as Christians. This has been a video on the philosophy of history. An awful lot of stuff uh, for which I feel sorry. Um, I w much more could be said. There is so much profundity, uh, I think, hidden in um, some of the ideas here.